Amelia Kotrinska is the head of marketing at UserPilot. And as you've heard from Amelia, she's taken her SEO strategy going from four blog posts per month to 40 blog posts per month on a very tight shoestring budget. And she's here to show you how you can do the same for your organization. Amelia, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernard. So I'll be sharing my screen in a moment, but just a little bit more of the backstory. So the first few months of 2021, we did a content audit with the help of this, you know, um, growth advisor. We kind of analyzed our competitors and Ahrefs um, content gap analysis, right? We looked at what they were ranking for, what we were ranking for, and we had like a massive content gap, like tens of thousands of keywords that we could rank for and uh, that we were it. So um, obviously we started from the planning stage and we identified like the different problem areas that user pilot is solving and clustered basically the keyword research around these problems. Um, and then, you know, we, we had like really bad experience with working with freelance writers and agencies in the past because we are a pretty technical B2B SaaS, you know, for product managers. So, you know, our audience doesn't take any prisoners, right? It's not like a lifestyle <laughs> brand where you can talk about food and travel or, you know, whatnot. It's not even, you know, like a mainstream sort of marketing automation tool. Mm -hmm. It's very, very niche. So the topics can be like, was the difference between one metric that matters and North Star metric, right? Or how to improve user activation rate, um, you know, with welcome screens or micro videos or whatnot. So freelancers usually didn't used to get uh, what, what we are about and um, how these problems can be solved with user pilot. And the purpose of the content is not just to obviously write content and rank for it and drive traffic, but to drive qualified traffic that has the chance of converting. So basically it has to show how to solve the problems that our audience is having with user pilot so mm -hmm. it requires a lot of screenshots a lot of product knowledge a lot of problem knowledge and a typical freelance writers don't have that so my idea was oh we need to hire in-house writers and of course. train them they are going to become product specialists Lord, did I know uh, how unscalable that is and how difficult it would be to find freelance writers who have like this specialist knowledge or like want to write about B2B SaaS, don't cost a fortune, and <laughs> at the same time, you know, want to write full time. Um, so I spent like, I think six or eight weeks looking for writers like that. I did find four by complete fluke. So, you know, someone's friend, came redundant I found someone like make an insightful comment in our Facebook group right and I was just like approaching these people and trying to poach them <laughs> and I did assemble a small team of four full-time writers and they had um, I would say a reasonable expectation to write between three and four blog posts a week this was uh -huh. the only thing they were doing gave them training they had four two weeks of training in the product and our, our personas everything we do la -da -da. and then you know fast forward three months like three of them have quit and i was very much back to square one like come <laughs> may and i feel like oh my gosh i'm such a failure i haven't really been able to scale this so far like why are these people quitting and basically you know, writing SEO content full time, especially for a B2B SaaS, can be pretty monotonous. So, you know, imagine you're a writer who used to work as a product manager, and now you have to write, like on Monday, you write Pendo competitors, on Tuesday, you write Upkiss competitors, on Wednesday, you write about Chameleon competitors, because the bottom of the final posts are the ones that rank best. So obviously, these people were like, what am I doing with my life? and quitting their jobs um, pretty quickly. So that's when I realized I need to go back to the drawing board, look what I'm doing wrong and invest more time in building systems rather than you know investing this time in building up people because people are people, right? And they all get sick, they all quit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I spent good two weeks um, 
talking to other content managers mm -hmm. and heads of content, both in other SaaS companies, in-house and in a content agencies to understand what they were doing. And you know, it was just kind of building up this um, knowledge and insights. And then one night, like of course, Sunday night, 3 a.m., it all clicked. <laughs> Of and <laughs> I literally like jotted down on a piece of paper, like the outline for the strategy. And now without much further ado, I'm going to share my screen and show you what we did. Right. So essentially, this is the backbone of our whole content um, operations. Um, I call it the content ethics system because it all centers about around these ethics. So essentially, this is Asana, and we like using Asana for several reasons that I'm going to explain as we go. And of course, if any of you have any questions, you want to stop me there, like Bernard, I will need your help with like looking if there is anything of course. in the chat. Um, but essentially, the ethics are these content clusters. So, you know, the problem areas that we are writing about, and um, we detected 10 clusters that we wanted to write about. They have changed a little bit since, um, but essentially 10 problem areas, 10 main topics that we created these epic tasks. So they're called milestone tasks in Asana 4. You can use Asana, but you can also use any other Kanban board or even you know, an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet if you're adventurous, but it's much easier to do it on a Kanban board. And, and then each of those milestone tasks has a particular delivery day, right? So if there are two posts, then there are two days of the week when posts on this epic are due. Um, and each milestone task, so each epic has one full-time content editor assigned to it. So introducing this role was really a game changer. This is the person that is responsible for quality of the blog posts. And essentially, they are responsible for creating super, super detailed briefs for these posts. And I will show you in a moment. So essentially, each epic has a delivery day on date on a specific day of the week. If we have 10, then it makes sense to obviously have two epics um, per day, right? And each epic is assigned to only one writer mm -hmm. and to one editor. So the editor actually, the editor manages one epic per day, right? So they have five epics under them, which is like the comfortable pace. They basically have to create five briefs per week, so one per day, and then also check five pieces of content per week from the previous week. All right, so let's take this engagement UX patterns epic. As you can see in the subtasks of the main task, there are all the content that we have been creating around this topic. So let's take one that has already been done, right? Um, this is the task for the writer. So the task for the writer is also created by um, the editor that is responsible for this epic. So every week they add basically a new brief, which is the super, super detailed, literally paint by numbers um, system you know, for, for the writer to use. So the writer doesn't actually have to have subject matter knowledge and expertise in, in this area. They just need to be able to follow instructions, think logically, write, and write well in an engaging style. Um, so the briefs always follow a certain template. We have several brief templates now that have like these fixed elements like word count, primary keyword, the links to the tools that we're using to optimize and manage content. We have the intro, instructions, too long didn't read, so our blog summary instructions. This is a game changer as well. Um, because you know, for SEO purposes, it's better to produce longer blogs. So usually a content management or content intelligence really tool like for instance, Periscope will tell you how many words you need to create a competitive blog on that topic. But for the readers, right, the readers rarely reach the bottom of the page, they rarely read to the end. 
So we create like this post summary for them with the main links and with the CTA embedded in like a bullet point list, which I will show you in a second. So we find a much higher conversion rate from the posts that have the TLDR versus the ones that don't have the TLDR. So it's just like a small hack. Um, and yeah, the content editor basically creates this brief in bullet points. They sometimes copy like fragments from our previous posts because we write a lot around the same topics to like cover, you know, and build some domain expertise in that. And they put all the headings that the writer needs to include in the post and all the links with indication of they should be do follow or no follow, all the images. So we have an image bank for the editors where we have like all the images categorized by different epics and by different topics that we cover. And then the editors can just tap into that and you know um, insert the screenshots. So the final product, the blog post looks like it's been written by someone who's a pro and who really knows the tools very, very well. Well, in fact, it's the head of content that has been taking all the screenshots over the course of a year and a half, and then they're just very well organized. And they have the right file names as well, which is important. Um, yeah, so, so that's the brief. It looks super long and super detailed, but it only takes our editors between one and two hours to produce this. Because as I said, we have all the resources, we have things like, this is the links repository, right? So again, the links for the content editors are organized by category. So they can just search for, for the relevant links and following our SEO SOP, insert them in the right places, right? Um, that's obviously Notion. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. It really helps organize, like the whole content operation that we have is organized on Notion. So systems, resources, SOPs, guidelines, checklists, and um, all the hiring materials. So over like these couple of years, we've really built a large database of resources. Um, and we also have epic brief templates, right? So for every epic, there are like these subject matter specific resources um, included there as well. So, so yeah, we have, we have a slew of questions. Okay, great. First of which will come from Mitangi. And the question is, can you explain what an epic is? I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, it's an epic looks like it can contain like multiple briefs and a whole lot of stuff. Is an epic like a topic that you're trying to go after? Yeah, exactly. So it's basically a topic cluster. So um, it's like a folder of blog topics that we want to write about. Um, that are related to the same topic cluster. So if you're familiar with the HubSpot content clusters, content strategy, um, basically you build like these content hubs that center around like the ultimate guide to a particular um, thing, usually a problem that your tool is solving, right? And then you build like the spokes, so the individual posts that tackle more long-tailed keywords, more like narrow topics and problems. So for instance, you have the ultimate guide to user onboarding, right? So the epic would be on user onboarding, as you can see here. Um, but you may also write like more narrow blog posts about for instance, best user onboarding tools or best user onboarding tools for SaaS, best user onboarding tools for large enterprises versus best user onboarding tools for SMBs, right? So these are all like the individual small spokes in the wheel, right? Which sort of come out of this bigger hub. Yeah, makes, makes total sense. Uh, a couple of other questions. Karina Wright asks, how many content writers and content editors do you have? And as a follow-up to that, Josh Cotone asks, are your writers in-house or freelance? No, they are all freelancers now. And um, they all write only one blog post per week. So we try to avoid the single point of failure. We currently have 10 freelance writers. So 
it might be even more yeah because now we've increased the budget but like if when we had 10 epics now we have 11 epics so we will have 11 writers right um 10 epic we had 10 writers so essentially we assign only one writer to each epic and they only have to produce one blog post per week for this epic so that way they have enough time they have a full week to work on the blog post they have like the sort of gain more knowledge about the epic over time so they are not spreading themselves too thinly and also if they have to like leave or are sick or whatever we only lose like 10 percent of our content output for that week not 30 or 50 um as we would if we had one writer cover like several blog posts um so we found that really works for us and then we have two full-time um, content editors that are in-house because this role requires a bit more subject matter knowledge to write these super detailed briefs. As I mentioned, they um, handle five epics each, right? So now that we will be scaling our operation even further, we'll be adding more um, content um, editors. Actually, because we have 11 now, we still have our head of content who's um, taking care um, of one of the epics. So she's sort of stepping into the shoes of the content editor to keep her hands in and writing one blog per, um, one um, blog brief <laughs> per week. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So there's a lot more questions. I figure you know, I'll ask you them here and then we can start moving on with some of your process. But after the editors spend a couple of hours creating the brief, how long do writers spend creating the content and how much are you paying for each of those different activities? Yeah, so sure. that's a very good question. So um, the editor writes the brief on the day of the, like when the epic is kind of due and they post the brief into basically Asana, right? So they create this task for the writer. Um, what happens, they press like tab plus B, that is a shortcut that allows us to essentially add this um, subtask as the main task to the to-do column, right? So it's already there, so it wasn't added, but basically the subtasks become main tasks in the main column. And then from that point, the writer has a full week to complete the task. They submit it on the next Wednesday. And then again, the writer picks it up on the Wednesday. And usually they spend like an hour, two hours on you know, editing the ready-made contents and comparing you know, the writer's output to the brief if nothing was missed if there are in some major areas that need improvement usually they there aren't right so we don't send it back to the writers uh, we have like a free strikes um, system if the writers are consistently not being able to follow the brief and even with revisions and comments from the editor they are not able to improve and then we basically end the cooperation with them um, when it comes to um, the pricing so it depends on let me show you it depends on our um on the word count so there are like several tiers i hope it's somewhere here the head of content has been moving things around a bit so yeah, so roughly we pay between $225 and $450 per blog post, right? $225, that's for like the shorter articles between 12 and 1400 words. And $450, that's for like the ultimate guides. So around 4,000, 4,500 words. And I was like trying to find the table with the pricing, right? Sorry, these are like um, kind of working files for, for each month. Um, yeah, but we have these, these brackets basically. So we don't pay the writers by word because that would quickly become very messy. 
but we do recognize that it takes more efforts to create a longer blog post than a shorter one. Awesome. All right, there are some more, but I figure we've done a slew of questions and I'd like for you to continue walking people through your so, process and then we'll get around to all the other yeah. questions that are continuing to pop up. Yeah, absolutely. I think I didn't like actually answer the, the previous question fully, so let me just follow up on that quickly. Um, so the editors are in-house, right? So we pay them basically a full-time salary. Um, but we did try to hire some part-time editors when we have a shortage of staff. So some of the best writers were basically promoted to a full-time editor, then we were paying them $100 per brief. And then we also have a proofreader, which I will mention in a second, and that is part of the process. And they charge us $25 per like the final language checks. Okay, so moving on, we created the ethics, the editor has created the brief, right? They have created the task for the writer. What happens next? Um, so essentially the writer, as I said, picks up where the editor left off on, you know, the day when the, on the epic day, right? Um, each day is an epic day at Ease of Pilot, right? Um, pardon my dad jokes. And when they get the, assignment they move it to in progress writing here on the asana board and spends around a week there as i mentioned then they move it to editing right and what happens in between though this is important they take the brief and they write the first draft in a content intelligence tool we are actually using surfer but it's pretty similar to um clear scope so i guess bernard would be able to explain the difference to you um, we made that decision already like a year and a half ago. So um, basically it's still working for us. Um, and yeah, it's um, essentially comparing the different blog posts that are already ranking for the keyword that we want to rank um, and, you know, creating this paint by numbers recipe, which keywords to include in what concentration, which headings to include the editors also use it to basically create the brief and it tells us how many words we should ideally include and then as the writers write the first draft in it it gives them a score um a score over 66 is considered a good score we are instructing our writers to hit 80 right so we want to make sure that our content is really really well optimized as you can see this writer hit 93 for this topic so pretty good Right, and what happens next? When the writer is done with Surfer, they've optimized the content, they copy the post and they move it to another tool that we are using. I will explain why we need so many tools in a second. So this is Story Chief. Story Chief is essentially a content management tool which allows the editors to communicate with the writers. And then it allows the proofreader to quickly publish this directly to our blog, our medium, and all our social media channels with one click. So the writer is pasting the output from Surfer into here, adding all the links, formatting, oops, formatting the um, content, and also adding the images, making sure that images have the right alt text, right? So everything is essentially ready to be published and they also add the featured image which is created by our in-house um, graphic designer so essentially we created a rule in asana that automatically adds a task for the graphic designer to create um, the featured image so the writers when they start working on this task they already have the featured image to include here in story chief they also add a meta description, meta title. They, um, the editor actually adds the right categories and tags. And also check that everything is fine here, that the writer followed the SEO guidelines in our checklist. Um, like Slug includes the target keyword, for instance, et cetera, et cetera. And then when the editor is actually happy, if they are not happy with something minor, they will leave the writer a comment like here they can say like 
yeah, so Adina here left a comment, right? Linked to this after it was published, I could say this is not the right word here or at the link here, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it really makes makes things easier. This is something that Surfer is not allowing us to do and Surfer is obviously not allowing us to publish um, the posts to like the final destination. So we need the story sheet as well. And then when the editor is done with editing the piece of content, first they add a payment. So sometimes when they are not able to finish the editing by the time, like by the end of the month, they add a payment for the writer before and just leave it in editing. Um, so essentially we created another board on Asana. Um, so we would put the writer's name here and let's say it was Tio, it wasn't Tio, but let's say it was. And we would put them in the freelancers payments, add to the fee and the month when it was done, right? So when we create this task, it goes straight to accounting, right? And accounting on this board can filter by the different writers and see on the list view how much basically we need to pay them in each month. So then when the writers send us invoices, we can very easily cross-reference um, basically their invoices, itemized invoices with what we have on our file. So that helps. And a funny tidbit, I introduced this follow-up task after I went on holidays and then I started getting a lot of emails from the writers that, hey, they haven't gotten their payment yet, what's going on? And it turned out a new operations manager like couldn't figure out Asana. So he couldn't like check if the writers really did all they said they did on the invoices. And he decided to wait until I come back from holiday. Um, so then I knew I have to basically create a system for that as well. Um, so, okay, essentially the editor is done with the post. They don't have any more comments. They are happy with it Just to go to the blog. They put it in proofreading. And this is where the proofreader picks it up. Again, they know they only need to go to storage sheet. They go on storage sheet. And the proofreader is usually a native speaker who's really good at grammar, really good at, um, you know, style and all that jazz. And they read the whole blog again to double check for any errors, any like idiosyncrasies. Because not all our writers are native speakers. Some are, some aren't. It doesn't really matter that much, um, to be fair. And then the um, proofreader is also responsible for running the content against the SEO checklist. Right, so when we go to the checklist, they go to the final SEO checklist, publishing procedure for editors, and they check if the writer has ticked off, you know, all these basically important items for us. Usually if Surfer and um, Story Chief say so, um, then it means, yes, it's been done, but we want to be really, really sure. Um, so yeah, um, then when the editor is ready, the proofreader is ready, I mean, um, with the post, they publish it through, as I said, um, story sheet. So it goes straight to our blog with all the meta title, meta description, the right slide, right? It goes into a menu with the canonical tag so that really helps this is like redistribution and medium is now our largest source of referral traffic on a good month we're getting like 20,000 views on medium so I would recommend you to use that and they also push it to our social media so that makes things really really easy um, but you know then they move it to publish repository and stick it off as done but, you know, sometimes I go through the blog or the head of content goes through the blog and they see some typos or they see something is missing. So then we basically create follow up task, right, and put it into two fakes for publishing after publishing. Right. And um, that means the editor that is responsible for this epic needs to go back to the already published post and still 
make some fixes. So I'm going to move it back to to do so the writer doesn't get confused <laughs> now. But yeah, this is like a very high level overview of what we are doing here. And as Bernard mentioned, we our initial target was to, to publish 40 blog posts a month instead of four. Um, we managed to hit that target at the end of last year, and now we are scaling it to 50. Um, 40 blog posts per month cost us consistently under $10,000. So with this system and with like the division of duties between the different roles, we were able to hire more junior writers um, who essentially charge less, right? They're not necessarily worse, but they don't need to have like super experience in SaaS and, you know, a degree in engineering to understand, say, how to style a tooltip in CSS, right? Because this is what we handle internally through all these guidelines. All right, right maybe, I guess maybe yeah. some questions. Sure. Uh, Josh asks, what are the output expectations for your writers? Are they simply just being assigned content to write and then producing it? Do you tie any traffic goals to what the writers are, are doing? Or is it simply just get it done, we'll pay you this amount of money, and that's, that's all the writers have to care about? The latter, get it done, we pay you the money. So we only care about the output because the writers don't decide anything related to the content strategy, right? So they can't be held responsible for the outcomes. This is something that we, you know, like the head of content and myself are responsible for. So um, we do like larger keyword research every quarter and then every month we still go through it and create these content plans that are basically monthly, right? So you can essentially see, you know, which epic, right, the specific blog post is um, in, which writer is going to tackle it, what is the keyword, right, um, what is the word count, um, what is the payment for this particular post, right? And this is like the working um, sheets that our head of content is using to manage like the monthly workload. Um, yeah, so also it wouldn't be fair of the writers because obviously in different epics, like there is a difference in intent, right? So some epics are very bottom of the funnel, like for instance, the tools epic or the onboarding epic, right? Where we write a lot about our tool, about our competitors but some epics are more top of the funnel so say product management related topics or ux related topics are more general and so there's also a difference in search volume and yeah it doesn't make sense to hold individual writers responsible for, for traffic goals or the outcomes yeah that makes sense as a follow-up to that since you were talking a bit about it uh, Dave asks, do you only start with SEO for content topic generation? So I think what he's saying is who comes up with the content topics? And I think I heard you answer that it's a combination of you and your editors and not the writers, right? The writers aren't really brainstorming topics. No. No, the writers don't brainstorm anything, not even what goes into the individual paragraphs and the briefs. It's not the editors that brainstorm that as well. It's the head of content, right? So mm -hmm. initially it was me, but then, you know, we promoted one of our editors into like the head of content role. And now she's responsible for brainstorming the individual topics, right? Based on the epics that we have and the keyword research that well, we've both done and, you know, she's doing some follow-up keyword research to uncover more topics around that as well. Yeah, so Kate asks then, how do you go about choosing the epics? Yeah, so essentially the epics have to be chosen based on the problems that our tool is solving. So it's kind of more like intent research rather than um, keyword or research. So we optimize the epics for intent. Uh, so it is very high level kind of understanding what our product does and what our audience wants. 
So, so that plus some ancillary epics that are more related to the audience and their problems in general. Um, ironically, I recently discovered that the worst leads that our content drives are the ones that have, you know, um, converted directly from one blog post. Right. So if someone just Googled one keyword, they found our blog, they went on the blog, read this one blog and directly booked a demo. Usually they are bad leads because they sometimes feel or think that our um, product only solves one problem. And because it's a larger platform, actually, it's a product growth platform that does both like user analytics and does experience says in app and it does in app surveys. Right, then people don't want to pay for the whole platform if they only have one use case. So like having this top of the funnel content that doesn't directly convert, um, that doesn't directly produce leads, but maybe leads to some assisted conversions is also very important because it educates the prospects and educates the, the market. So we have like a balanced diet of bottom of the funnel ethics. And we're like, you know, there is some meat and there is vegetables, right? Yeah. Definitely. So I guess a follow-up question to that, Henna asks, do you do att attribution tracking so you can see how many posts each new lead or customer reads before converting? And an interesting follow-up to that just off the top of my head is, do you know how many is the optimal amount of blog posts like, that somebody should read before they end up, say, becoming a higher converting lead or potential customer? That's a great question, Hannah. Um, I don't know that yet, but uh, maybe I'll learn something from you and start actually tracking the optimal number of blog posts, that the best leads um, are consuming before they become, you know, like our customers. Um, that's a bit tricky because, um, you know, Google Analytics and Search Console gives you anonymous data, right? So you see the sheer conversions, but you don't know who that is and are they a good prospect or not, right? So we also use HubSpot. So we have a script installed on our blog that is kind of trying to attribute um, basically um, website traffic to specific leads and specific companies. But I find that it only kind of matches roughly 50% of the leads and the rest is like just random misattributed traffic that it says like random things like sources from integra integration or direct because as you will probably know with attribution in organic, it's, it's pretty tricky because there are like the cross device and cross channel um, issues and you know, if the attribution window is longer, so someone, I don't know, bookmarked your post six months ago and then they just found it um, again, then like a lot of these tools don't pick it up anymore after the 90 day attribution window. Um, but what we do, because of course we need to somehow track if our content is um, leading to any good results or not. Um, we essentially build these dashboards on Google Data Studio um, that plug into our Google Analytics and the Search Console. And we are tracking, you know, how many users each blog post that we've produced in 2022 has um, produced, right? How many new users, how many demo button clicks, and how many demos booked. This is, you know, a cumulative view from the beginning of this year, right? And also the conversion rate. So this is just like last touch, very, very conservative attribution. Because um, correct me if I'm wrong, Bernard, maybe I will learn something from you, but I feel like um, Google Data Studio doesn't allow you to look at um, assisted conversions, or does it as a metric? I am not 100% clear on, on that. Mm. Yeah, I, I, like last time I checked at least, um, I couldn't find it, so I was Googling that bit. So yeah, um, that's why we're looking at these last touch attribution. Um, and yeah, you can see that the posts, these are only posts that we produced this year, right? So not including all the others we produced the year before and the year before. So as you can see, they already resulted in 20 demos. Um, they already drove like over 42,000 visitors. Um, and then we look at the conversions 
month by month. And these in turn are our best, not best performing, but these in turn are our blog posts basically in general. Uh, we're looking at total content performance month by month as well. Uh, it's a duplicate. Yeah, and then I'm just looking at the number of users and the conversion rate month over month to see like the general trend. So that was from Google Analytics and from Search Console, we're also monitoring the keywords that we um, basically optimize the content for this year. So each individual blog post and we're looking, are they improving, right? If they are improving, as you see in this first example, SaaS onboarding process, that's good. Of course, if they're dropping, then it's an indication we need to go in and probably um, update this post, do something about it. So we try to monitor this regularly, at least like once per month. Um, and then we're also looking at our all-time top converting keywords. This is super important, right? Because uh, yeah, if these are like for your honeypots, you don't want to um, start dropping in search for, for these keywords. Uh, so that's the mistake we made like a year, yeah, a year ago, yeah, roughly a year ago. It was actually um, when, you know, we discovered that after publishing all these new blog posts, our uh, traffic actually declined at some point and we were like what the hell and then our advisor told us like oh you seem to have dropped you know inserts for these like bunch of keywords that uh, you were aiming for that coincided with the big google update back then right in june 2021 um so we went in and we started doing content updates afterwards as well so, so there is that. And if you guys are interested in these dashboards, I have actually unlocked them on my Patreon. So I have this like content ops Patreon here and Google Data Studio. Yeah, basically, if you're interested in that, I created these uh, templates so for instance that one right that one is for uncovering opportunities from existing keywords um but there are like i will send it to bernard so he can like put it in the show notes somewhere so you can just like copy this template and, and use it for your content tracking if you want right yeah i put the link to your patreon in okay. the chat but We'll also distribute it in the follow-up email. Kristen has just a, a note. She says that assisted conversions are tricky via Google Data Studio alone. What mm. they've been doing is offering a unique offer code assigned that persists if people click through but don't convert, but that's not super helpful if people bounce and then come back way later. So mm, yeah. just to comment <laughs> on, <laughs> on that. Uh, Elon asks, what's the contribution of each blog? I mean, you were basically showcasing it that, but do you get 25% more leads by publishing 25% more blogs? Uh, no, <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. Um, so if you're investing in content, you need to like brace yourself. It's a very long-term game, right? So it's, the growth is not linear. Um, but it is correlated. So like this year, our content like really, really took off from around 26,000 visitors in February to now, yeah, what, what is it now? 55, right now it's 50, but by the end of the month, it will be around 55, 57, if things keep going like that. Um, so essentially, yeah, our average number of demos went from like 8, 10 to 12, 13 per day. So you can see the impact of the content it isn't linear. Um, a year ago, we only had 10 blog posts that were consistently driving conversions. Um, now we have around 30. So, you know, we added like basically 200% more you know, blogs that are converting, but as you as you probably know, and as you can see from, from here, especially in such a niche industry, right? 
you don't have a lot of um, blogs with super high search volumes that people are just, you know, the drive thousands of visitors. So you need to create a lot of niche content that is only, you know, driving like maybe at best a few hundred, right? Plus um, a few conversions per month, right? So it's not going to be like spectacular overnight results, but if you do it consistently, it's an evergreen source of leads. And of course, if you do update and maintain um, your blog properly, um, that's kind of, you know, something that keeps on giving and like Google ads where you have to constantly invest more budget, right? Totally. We have at least four more questions. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you all of these. Um, any learning curves for your writers to use Surfer? Um, so we have SOPs for that. I wouldn't say because, um, so it's again, the editor's job to set up the Surfer editor for our writers. So they put in the keyword, they select the competitors that we want to, you know, like compete against, they deselect the relevant pages, they deselect irrelevant keywords that may have fallen in. So that does happen. So the editor has to do some work on Surfer. Um, and the writer just comes into the fully set up editor and writes. So not much. Nice. Josh asks that when you are showcasing one of your briefs, there were sections that your editors would write that say, write something similar to, are these lifted from competitor posts or, or are these something that the ed editor writes and is just saying, do this, but better? Um, usually from our own posts. <laughs> So, um, because we have already, you know, written so much around these topics, and then, you know, we, we take it from our previous content on similar topics, so not to reinvent the wheel constantly. Sometimes it is that the editor writes something themselves, or they may have sourced some content, you know, from like an expert, so they, they add a quote there, right? Um, usually, no, we don't like to lift it from... Uh, competitors because I think that's a bit unethical. Yeah. And then Anonymous asks, where do you find information on each topic through links stored in each epic or another repository of background information? No, we just Google stuff, right? So we read around it. Um, yeah. And then, you know, we also try to provide some original insights. So we often like interview people. I want to bake that more into the process. So, so far as like being a bit informal, so it's, it's kind of hit and miss and um, whether the editors have time to implement it or not. But moving forward, we are planning to every month at the beginning of the month when, you know, we have listed all the topics for the month. And um, in the epic, we are planning to like give the editors a day to sort of collect insights from subject matter experts and basically like improve the eats of our content, right? So the authority um, and make it more like thought leadership as well. Awesome. One more question, or now there's some more trickling in, but Dave asks, what are the big benefits of Story Chief? Our team uses WordPress, WordPress, which seems to include several similar features, auto posting to social, can publish to email. But yeah. why, why are you on Story Chief? Yeah, so um, first of all, uh, we also use WordPress, right? So I'm aware of, of these features and there are some similarities indeed, but on WordPress, you can't really communicate with the writers. So as far as I know, at least you, you can't say, add comments on WordPress, right? So um, you basically let the writers write inside. And I feel like the um, editor is also not that super user and readability friendly. It's more challenging to, for, for us at least, to like read the content and, um, basically check it for any errors. So these are the reasons. Um, 
and yeah um also the distribution right we, we can push it to medium directly i feel like but especially the commenting is, is a factor right also the benefit when the writers write in um story sheet is that we, it has this basically repository of images so we basically store our image bank here largely in the image library i, I know wordpress also has that right so it's kind of similar minus the commenting and distribution. Nice. Josh asks, as you grow your output, do you find that you need to go further up funnel and away from purchase intent? And if so, do you anticipate conversions on new posts dropping over time? And if yes, how would you measure success in that case? Yeah, that's a really question. I, I thought the same, um, Josh, right? Um, I thought exactly the same that, well, inevitably we have to go up funnel and um, we're going to run out of ideas for bottom of the funnel content anytime soon. And just a few months ago, like three months ago, it really felt like that. Um, but then I went to Brighton SEO. <laughs> I was speaking about this workflow there as well, but you know, when I was sitting in the audience at one panel, um, about essentially long-tailed zero search volume keyword research. It dawned to me that there was no such thing as running out of bottom of the funnel keywords. Um, and yeah, funnily enough, um, I came up with this, another process of generating these derivative keywords that are long-tailed and probably either zero search volume or you know very low search volume but we don't really worry about that because there are so high engines that you know um it compensates for the low search volume and besides as we all know it's not like your content ranks for only one keyword right when you optimize it for one keyword it starts ranking for like hundreds of other similar keywords so usually you see a discrepancy between what the um, keyword research tools tell you, right? So Ahrefs tells you, oh, this keyword only has 10 search volumes. So how come you're getting like 500 or 1,000 visitors per month from it, right? Have you ever wondered about that? Yeah. So essentially, it's all these other smaller keywords that drive traffic as well. So we are like, why don't we just stop looking at the search volume for this and we start looking at intent? So I collected, as you saw in the previous dashboards, I collected the top converting keywords in one dashboard. And then I created a filter um, that's an uh, rejects that essentially excludes all the exact matches of these highest converting keywords. So we don't like duplicate this content, but it includes fuzzy matches. So it includes all the keywords that contain this high intent, highly converting keyword. And that essentially generates these derivative keywords, right? Some of them don't make sense. Some of them do make sense. We rank for this keyword with existing content, but then I sorted, you know, this by average position from like well, the lowest, right? So somewhere on the ninth or 10th page, right? We are ranking with one of our posts for this keyword, but it means that we should probably create a breakout page that will be optimized for the super long tailed, you know, low search volume keyword that might have high intent. So of course that's just like automatically created. So a human with some gray matter would need to still like go through that and select the ones that really make sense for us and put them in the right epics. But that's another way how you can keep creating content that is bottom of the funnel and that will generate conversions. All right, a couple more and then we'll wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Stephanie asks, is this the search intent template on the Patreon? Is what, sorry? The, the search intent template, the little like regexes of things. That... Yes, yes, that, that's also there, yeah. Cool. Then I would say the last one, and I know this one's very tricky, but how do you measure the ROI of your articles so that it makes sense for the business? 
Uh, so as I said, like attribution with content is a um, challenge because of all these like, yeah, cross domain, attribution windows, la di da, right? But we essentially see that the majority of our leads come from content, right? So recently it went even up to like 80, 82%. Um, so dark, even just knowing that we know that there is an ROI, right? And then we pass them on to the sales team. Once you know they booked a demo, we are done with them. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can look at HubSpot and then see basically if there is a large deal, then I like to go into HubSpot, look at the script that is installed on our blog and see if you know it managed to attribute this um, deal. And sometimes it does and it shows me basically which pages um, the contacts from these deal have visited. So then I know, well, yeah, we, we managed to bring in this and that many thousands in ARR from these specific blog posts. But I have, I'm fortunate enough to have a CEO that doesn't like, you know, sweat too much over like every single, you know, piece of content and attributing everything. Because, you know, at some point, and this is also what our advisor, he used to be this VP of marketing told us, but you need to choose when you are a startup and have a small team, are you going to be spending all your days like trying to attribute things and sweating over data, right? Or are you going to invest this time in actually, you know, creating things that move the needle? So of course, if something is obviously not working, then we're trying to dive deep into that and investigate what is happening. Like if, you know, some of our important converting pieces drop in SERPs or, um, if we have like unexplained traffic drops or unexplained drops in the number of demos, then yeah, we do spend a few hours investigating that. But we are at this point, um, we have a full time team of six in the marketing department now, and that covers like all the areas of marketing. So we can't really afford to have a data scientist who would like pour over things full time. And we basically need to make these choices. So knowing that 80% of our deals um, and leads, I mean, come from, from organic content, we decided to kind of just focus on producing more content. Makes total sense. Well, lots of positive feedback from the audience, Asma's saying, this is very helpful to me as a newly promoted content manager. Cindy says, thank you. I'm off to ratchet up our content briefs. Elon Shah, saying thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you, so much, thank you Emilia, for sharing you, the Brian. under the hood. I found it super interesting, right? To see how a, a shop that's doing 40, moving to 50 blog posts is managing their content process and all under $10,000, right? I feel like that's, that's huge. And when you, know, you say 80% of your leads are coming through SEO, you know you're doing something right and the team i'm sure at user pilot is like wow we just need amelia to to start doing outbound now too why not right yeah, like, that she's happened. the master <laughs> lead generator right <laughs> oh thank you so much Bernard. thank you everyone i i hope you will find this useful and if you have any questions just find me on linkedin and yeah i'll, I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible awesome well, take care, everyone. Now, before we wrap this up, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe so you don't miss out on more great content from the industry's best SEOs, content marketers, and content strategists. The ClearScope webinar series happens every week and helps SEO content creators of all skill levels advance their knowledge. Hope to see you tune in next time.